Turn with me to Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, and we're just going to ease into a word today that I believe the Lord has uh, given me to share with you. Romans 6, 16. It's kind of a, a lengthy passage, but I think most of you are familiar with it. And that's where I want to preach from today. I'm going to share an old song here in a minute. How many like old songs? Amen. You don't have to be old to like an old song. You don't have to be old to sing an old song. So just so you know, I'm singing it and I'm not old. But I, I, learned, I might have learned it from someone who was old. <clears throat> know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. See, there's only two choices given here. There's, no, there's not a whole list of options. It's, it's either A or B, light or dark, sin or righteousness, life or death. 17, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you being then made free from sin. Those that obeyed the doctrine, the teaching, the preaching of the gospel and got these baptism certificates have been made freed from sin. You became servants of righteousness. The old song says you got to serve somebody. You know, a lot of times in our youth, in our ignorance, we say, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, that's the most ignorant thing you could say because somebody is always telling you what to do. You are not your own. You, you, it's not within you to direct your own steps, and you're either serving righteousness or you're serving sin. If you say no to righteousness, oh, I don't have time for that or that's for the sissies, or that's for somebody else. And that's for old people and children, some folks say. Well, you've just declared yourself a slave to sin. <clears throat> Verse 20 says, When you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof now you're ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if someone had uh, tickets to eternal life today, and they were walking the aisles and holding them up, who would not reach out and take hold of that and put it in a keep a safe keeping place? Amen? So that's what we're talking about. That's really what's happening when you are in the presence of the Lord, when you hear the gospel preached. Someone is giving you a chance at eternal life. Who wouldn't receive it? Amen? I mean, you would empty your bank account. You would give your latest purchased automobile. You'd do whatever it took to know that you, you laid hold on eternal life. And that's the gift of God today. And you don't have to give up your car or your house or your bank account. Just give him your heart. Amen. A few years ago, Paula and I were uh, traveling over to the East Coast. We 
We were going to a wedding. And on the way to the wedding, we decided to stop over in Charleston, South Carolina, and visit the slave market. There's a place there that's now set up. It's more like a shopping area, flea market, and some restaurants and coffee shops and things of that nature. But historically, it was known as the port where the ships were brought in with hundreds of Africans who would become slaves to work and to produce uh, many times crops and, and do uh, all kinds of things in America. And you don't have to look too far. I mean, that, that sounds so distant and so unbelievable to us in our culture. But you don't have to look too far around the world to find slavery exists today. Amen? As cruel as it may seem and as inhumane as it is, it is existing in the world today. And as a matter of fact, there's something called trafficking that's going on in our country right under your nose in every town, every city, every state of this United States. Little girls are being sold as a commodity. And that just, I mean, if you can talk about that and not get messed up, then something's very wrong with you. You get teared up, you get moved thinking about reading books about our history and thinking about people in the world today that are suffering. But there's a, a worse tragedy going on in this very room, and that is people who have sold their own soul to the slavery of sin in many different forms, many disguises, people that are living their lives in freedom as a person, but in bondage in their soul. I want you to listen to the words of this old song. It's, it's called, If You Had Known Me. Just an old rejected relic on the auction block. They decided to throw me away. The auctioneer said, Who will take him? The room stood quiet and still then a stranger stepped forward and he said I will if you had known me before Just heartache and tears And a life that was filled with despair oh, But for my rags 
He gave me riches for my fear. He traded peace, and from my old life, He gave me blessings. Amen. Adam chose the path of disobedience and sold all of humanity for all of history all the way to the cross sold us out to slavery, to sin. Jesus came, became a man, the Bible says, stepped up as the last Adam and made the choice of obedience to righteousness. And in his suffering, purchased me back. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was bought with a price. Hallelujah. No one could buy me back but Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 24, No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. He plays the uh, opposing forces here, God and mammon, or God and substance, or God and money, or God and whatever you can fill in the blank that you may succumb to in your spiritual walk. And I know that some are sitting here today and and, and you're free. You've been set free, and you're thankful for your freedom in Christ. And so I don't want you to take the pitchfork approach to the sermon today and say, well, he's not talking to me. But every one of you in this room, if you're not in bondage to something, whether it's a small thing or a great thing, you may be in bondage in your mind to a thought pattern. You may be in bondage to old habits that just, you know, that sin that easily besets or that weight that just keeps you from fully accomplishing the purposes of God. And if you don't fall in any of those categories today, I'm still talking to you because I guarantee you know someone without a doubt who's suffering with spiritual bondage, someone who's addicted, someone who's held by sin's grip. And so I want you to pay close attention. In Genesis 37, we come to a story here where uh, Joseph, who was a type and shadow of our Lord Jesus and has many parallels that we could discuss in that story. But here in the story, Judah said to his brethren in verse 26, what profit is it if we slay our brother? They were pretty upset with Joseph, mad enough to kill him. And here's a brother who has an entrepreneurial mindset. 
And he says, if we kill him, that's not going to profit anything. But this guy, he does have some things going for him. I bet we could get a pretty penny on the slave market for our little brother that makes us so angry. And so Judah comes up with the idea, let's don't kill him, let's sell him. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lifted Joseph up out of the pit they had put him in and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now the story goes on, and of course they turned around and sold Joseph for a profit and, and marked up the price and sold him into Potiphar's house, and, and that just God just was able to turn that thing around. Amen? Look at somebody and say, God's going to turn it around. We weren't meant to be slaves. We weren't meant to be in bondage. Human beings were, were not meant to be forced to do things. We were given a, a choice, a will, and God would love to just use that will to drive and to move and to bless the kingdom of God. Amen? And any time you sell out and you get in bondage to anything, you are just hindering the forces of God working through you in freedom. Freedom scares the devil to death. The, the evil governments <coughs> excuse me, of the world, they, they, they can't stand freedom. They, it, it bothers them when we make our own choices. It bothers them when, when freedom reigns because not everybody does what they want you to do. Not everybody does the right thing. The thing about freedom is it's freedom to do good also freedom to do bad but it's freedom nonetheless and there's a, a force of good in the earth that far outweighs the force of evil and the news and the world and the pressures of life and sometimes your bank budget would tell you that the forces of evil are so much greater that that you're so outnumbered but how many know that God is on our side how many know that you're not outnumbered ever you and God are a majority in any crowd. He's got more fighting for you than they that be against you. Open your eyes, Gehazi, and see that the multitudes are all over the horizon. They're fighting your battles. They're on your team, and we win. We sang about victory early. Every victory, every victory, every victory, because we're going to win. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. So Jesus shows up in, in Matthew, and, and he, it says, when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Matthew 21 and 10, if you have your Bible, you can turn to there. It said, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Uh, it's not hard for us to understand that if we, we set up our altar down here, and we had people down here with cash registers and little credit card swipes. And we set it up down here in the front. And we said, come on down here. You, want, you, you, you got a, a headache? We're, we're doing headaches for $10. We're, you know, if, if you're, you got knee and joint pain, uh, we're doing knee and joint pain today. We're running a special on those. They're normally 50 but today we're doing it for $25. And, we just begin to auction off the things of God. But you know how many people have merchandised the gospel? It, it, 
not in such a blatant way, but they put a price tag on it, and Jesus goes into the temple, and these guys are standing there, and they said, if you're going to get forgiveness for hitting that guy last week, you got to give us two turtle doves. And since you didn't bring any two turtle doves, we got some for sale over here. Kaching. And they were just racking it up. And Jesus walks in and says, uh-uh. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Number one, if, if you really put the price on the forgiveness of God, the shed blood that it's going to take to redeem you, you couldn't afford it. Amen? And if that money's going to go to anybody, it's not going to go to the people who have politically put themselves in some hierarchy to rob and pillage and drain the people of God. Amen? That's why God uses willing servants to share his gospel. You cannot put a price on it. My house shall be called a house of prayer. The issue Jesus has with the scenario is a price being placed on forgiveness and absolution, being marketed, and man making a profit from the condition of souls. It's, God never intended that to be. In Mark 8, Jesus says, For whosoever shall save his life will lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's a rhetorical question. It's, it's a question for which we don't have an answer. But I could list you off a list of names of people who have sold their soul for a very low price. People have sold their soul for a job or for fame or for drugs or for alcohol or nicotine or friendships and popularity and applause of men and on and on and on success, sports. So many things are being thrown up and so many People are sitting there with that little paddle bidding on your soul. And the auctioneer just keeps rattling off your name and they keep throwing up paddles. I'll give this and I'll give this and I'll give this. And every now and then you'll get a reminder that Jesus says, I'll give this. Amen. Proverbs 11 and 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. There's only one thing that can buy your soul, and that's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Anything else is a false balance. Anything else anybody offers you to free your soul is not going to be worth it. It's not going to carry the weight. It's not going to purchase what you're worth. False advertising is against the law. You can get in trouble if you advertise something to do a certain thing and it doesn't, doesn't do it. That's why, that's why everything you buy has a whole ton of fine print. You know, up here on the sign it might say it'll do this and this and this, but down here in the fine print it basically says, no, it won't. <laughs> And some lawyer figured out how to write it in such a way that you didn't get it until you end up in court, and then you get it. Like, oh, okay, I see. I understand. False advertising. Bait and switch. Boy, the enemy is so good at bait and switch. Have you ever bought something that you, and went to get something or went to see something? Uh, oh, we sold out of those just a few minutes ago, but we got this. You ever been there? Oh, man, it just drives me crazy. I want to hit somebody. <laughs> Told me I could get that. Bait and switch. Bait and switch. Amen? Advertise big, deliver little. Whew. 
Man, we see it every day, don't we? And you know, if we're not careful, churches will do that. Advertise big and just deliver little. But we, the people of God, need to always undersell and over-deliver. Because you can't oversell Jesus. I can say, he's really good. He's, he's the best thing ever. And then when you get him, you're like, you never told me it was this good. Amen. Hallelujah. It's like when I got married, you know. <laughs> Went back to my parents and I said, what in the world? You never told me it was this good. Wow. Talk about over-delivering. God over-delivered when he gave me Paula. <laughs> no bait and switch on that one. <clears throat> now here's a story familiar to everybody. and It's Matthew 26. Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. A woman came having an alabaster box. How many know the alabaster box story? I'm going to point something out in this that I just got in and out, wasting, and turns right around and sells the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Let me talk to you about how you place value, where you place value. 300 pence in that day, they say that a man could earn one pence by working all day long. So 300 pence would be more than a year's wages if you worked six days a week. 30 pieces of silver was valued at less than 200 pence. Think about that. When it was up to Judas to value a box of oil, he placed a value on it. He said, that's worth 300 pence. Just like that. He didn't have to go look it up on Google or eBay. He just said, that's worth 300 pence. He knew the value of a box of oil. And in the same breath, he valued his very best friend, his mentor, his Lord and Savior at 30 pieces of silver. And I sit here going, that is crazy. That is unbelievable. I would never do that. But do you know how many of us value our time alone with God so low that we'll trade it's quiet because you you're afraid I'm going to start meddling value our attendance to the house of God so low. Value our relationships in the body of Christ that somebody can say something sideways or we can get a misunderstanding and the next thing you know we're not speaking to that person or we're, in a, we're offended and we can't even go back to grow group or come on Wednesday night because you see how so easily we can become of that Judas spirit why are they spending all that money on this and why we could have my goodness we could do this and we could do that somebody told me one time well, look how many poor people we could feed with the money for pavement on a parking lot because the value of worship the value of putting Christ first people have a skewed view of worship. And we don't realize sometimes how quickly we can be deceived by false balance. That things take worth in our life 
that should be given up and things that should be valuable like time with the Lord, Bible reading, getting in a Bible group, inviting people to the house of God, things that should be of a value. We just kind of downplay. Amen? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What do you hold as high in value? Jesus places the value of your soul greater than all of the world. There's nothing you can compare it to. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own so, in other words, you pile it all up, gain the whole world. And you know some folks could gain the whole world and still wouldn't be satisfied. You, you know those people that every time you see them, they're driving a different car. Every time you talk to them, they're moving somewhere else. Every time you talk to them, they're just constantly craving. They, they've changed jobs. They've bought another business. They're just constantly in transition, moving, 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 never satisfied. I used to drive by a house in, uh, when I was young in Mississippi. There was a house on the side of the highway, and about every six months, that house would be painted a different color. One time, it was bright purple. It was just a wood frame house, nothing special about the house. But it just it was always getting painted. They just never could be be happy with it. We we lived a, a, near a house here in town, and it, it seemed like as soon as they would get through scraping and working on that exterior and get the get it painted and get the shutters back on, in, in in just a few weeks it seemed like they were back up on ladders out there painting and working and scribing and scraping again. I was like, man, that thing will not hold paint. That's some bad siding. I, I think I would just put vinyl siding on there and be done with it. But there's something on the inside that's craving and looking and cannot be satisfied until you fill that void with what really matters. You can have eternal life. You can go from nicotine to alcohol to the entry-level drugs to the next drug and you can just keep moving and moving and moving and you know I talked to somebody recently who got in some kind of a drug and it, it would just slam you completely out of the planet and just all this kind of tripping and carrying on and and mess with your mind and all this kind of stuff they got they got stuff out there that people go to the very edge of death with and some people die with the, with the drug and I'll tell you, I've lived 61 years on planet Earth, and I've never met one person who came to me and said, man, you know what? I just wish I'd have started smoking cigarettes a lot earlier. <laughs> never, never met anyone who said, man, I, I got into crack cocaine at 21, but I wish I'd have known about it when I was 12, man. I'd be really cruising now. Never. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. You're on a pathway that has no destination. It just gets worse. They don't put billboards up to advertise cigarettes with a lung cut open. It's filled with black. They don't do that. They don't advertise the Chablis on a billboard with an innocent child laying in a hospital bed with stitches all down his face because somebody was drinking and driving. That's not how the devil paints the picture. 
It's like, oh, it won't hurt anything. Oh, I can handle it. Oh, I can, I'll be all right. I'll just try this. Uh, my friends are all doing it. They, they look like they're fine. They're going to look fine because the devil's got a target on your back. All my other buddies are in illicit affairs and they're getting away with it. Someone just recently told me that they were caught up in a trap of sin and looked me straight in the eye and said, everybody else is getting away with it. I said, that's a lie. You believe a lie and you'll be damned because it may look like they're getting away with it on the surface. They may look like they're just clicking along happy and fine, but on the inside, they're being wore out by the liar and the deceiver and the, the, the enemy of your eternal soul. If you're young in here and you haven't tried some of these things yet, all, listen to that. All of us that have been around a minute, we'll just go ahead and tell you, don't. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. Amen? Don't sell your soul to be accepted by your friends. I know when you're young, you think, man, they'll like me. I, I want them to like me so much. If I'll do that, man, they'll like me. I'll be more popular. With who? Popularity in hell is just not worth much. You know how many people I see on a day-to-day -day basis that I graduated high school with? The same as you do. None. You know how many of them people in the eighth grade that was trying to get me to smoke cigarettes and chew tobacco? That's what we did in the 70s. <laughs> Dip snuff. And, and putting the pressure on me. Come on, man. Come on, man. You know how many of them people contribute to my life today? Most of them are dead, divorced, despondent, despair, depressed. Most popular guy I graduated with drowned on graduation night in a boat drinking beer. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Esau sold out for soup. Saul was bought by jealousy, envy. Cain killed his brother, Abel, over a style of worship. People sell out for the craziest things. So little, but God who is rich in mercy. Now, I'm going to tell you how to get rich. I'm going to tell you how to get happiness. I'm going to tell you how to get your soul redeemed from that bondage, that slavery. N know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Whatever you yield to, whatever you give in to, and it's easy to give in. It's easy to give in, but you become a slave to it. The minute you do it, you become a slave to it. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. If you come today, hear this word of the Lord Yield yourselves, lay down your life, you will save it. Yield yourself to righteousness. Yield yourself to God. Say, here I am, Lord. I'm tired of being a slave to something that I can't control. I want to get in the arms of the one who made me, and I want to be controlled. I want to be a slave, a love slave to my Lord. I want to serve you, God. I want to do what pleases you. I want to be a partaker of eternal life. You can be the next one getting a baptism certificate. You can be the next one who's free.
For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in the things which you are now shamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And my favorite scripture in all of the Bible, Romans 6, 23. You know what Romans 3, 23 says? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but, everybody shout, but, but, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.